Welcome back to E39 Source. This is Ryan Schultz. I've got the 2000 M5. This is part two of the E60 M5 manual swap. My E39 isn't here, but Sean's car is making an appearance, the F10 and Canon's E36. So part one on this swap went up a couple weeks ago now, and uh, we're ready for part two. In fact, the job's about done. Part three is going to focus on wiring and coding. Part two, we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of the mechanics clutch pedal, the interior, the rear main seal, the clutch pressure plate flywheel, the drive shaft, some interior disassembly, a lot of stuff like that. But before we get into that, before we get too deep, uh, we got to talk about the blue tape people here. We all love finding these things on our porch, right? FCP Euro has been instrumental in this project and helping us out with some of these parts. And uh, I want to take a minute and talk about FCP as a BMW part supplier. So pretty much anything and everything they sell includes a lifetime warranty, even on consumable parts. I love to use oil as the example, or brake pads or brake rotors for that instance. Um, you buy the part from them, you use it, you put it on your car, it, it goes through its useful service life, and uh, say the part fails, or like oil, five, seven thousand miles down the road, it's time to change it. You buy another kit, you get it, you install it, you send the old stuff back, and you get your money back. It's a lifetime warranty on everything they sell. Again, a big thanks to FCP Euro for their support with this project. Let's talk about some interior disassembly, namely the center console here. Now, I've already done a good bit of work. I wanted to understand how it's done um, before trying to explain it. So step one is simply removing the either wood or Titan line trim that you have up here with the vents in it. And you pretty much just get a non-marring plastic pry tool. Uh, but I started on that side and you just pry it out and you want to make sure that it comes out straight. Don't peel it out. The only electrical connector is the switch in the center right here in between the middle two vents for hazards and, on, and the locking, the central locking button. Um, as you get this piece pulled out a little bit, you can see it, it clips in with a clip there, a clip here, two more. Um, you could pop out the little switch and unplug it. It's one electrical connector. It's, I don't know, it's maybe this one. So, <laughs> uh, with that out of the way, we're greeted with two black Phillips screws right here that go through this hole and this hole on this center stack here, for lack of better terms. It's the HVAC panel and then this surround panel that goes around the navigation computer. And then this, it's, it's all one piece, which was surprising to me. But once we remove those two Phillips screws, then we can again use a plastic non-marring pry tool to sandwich in between right here and right here and pry outwards. And then the same thing between here and here and pry outwards. And if we look at the back of this, we'll see that it's simply held onto the dashboard with a series of four clips. That comes off and then we're greeted with the SZM panel here. And it's not really held in with anything. It's just sitting in there, plugged in with uh, three electrical connectors. This one, this one, and this one. And they all work as you'd expect. This one pulls out. This one has the little typical little lock lever on it. And then this one just has a tab you depress and, and pull this out. So we can take this out and discard it, sell it, whatever. We're going to be putting in a different one. We're not ready to button all this back up yet because we're going to have to make some pinning changes here. After we've gotten this taken apart here, which just takes a few moments, we can go ahead and remove the wood or Titan, whatever they call that aluminum center console trim here. Now the SMG plate that has the DSC power and EDC buttons in it here, that thing just pries right up. I just use my fingers, no tools necessary. Just kind of grab the side of it, pull it up and pull it up a little bit over here. Then if you can reach the wires, there's like five or six wires that are connected to it. And they all look like this. They just pull off no tabs or clips or anything. Um, if you can reach those, fine. If you can't, um, the SMG shift knob, for lack of better terms, is installed onto this, just like a normal manual shift knob is. So what you want to do is open your sunroof like this, and then you're going to take a seat on the center console spread eagle over the center console and pull up firmly. Now don't pull it so hard that when it gives you're going to rip all the wires out of the car. So try to pull firmly but once it gives be prepared to um, not pull it four feet away. Uh, once it's off then you can lift the whole thing up, disconnect all the wires and put that to the side. Um, next the iDrive knob simply lifts off. I was just able to kind of grab it on both sides and pull straight up. It clips on. I'm using it as a screw holder for now, but it's really lightweight. And this is CCC navigation. I imagine the CIC is about the same thing, but 
that would only be, I think, 09 and 10. Then there are two screws. They're um, T20, Torx 20. They're silver in color. They were down here. Those hold the center console in. Then you have these two pins back here. They're part of the center console, and they sink down into these two acceptors, just like the center dashboard um, finisher did. And then you have another T, another two T20s up here that hold in this thing. This holds the ashtray, and I think ours is broken, but the, the little lighter element here. Um, and then when you have all of this off, the piece that Kenan was holding here a minute ago, uh, that reveals two more T20s, and they're a little bit tricky to get to. You've got to go in at a bit of an angle, but my just a normal T20 um, screwdriver with a, a T20 bit on the end worked fine. Then this whole thing comes out. We're not going to be reusing that, so we can stick that out of the way. Then we have this, and this is held in with three T Torx 30s. One at the bottom, in the middle, they're pretty long bolts, and then two at the top. There's two wiring harnesses that attach to this whole SMG shifter thing. There's a big one here with a, a, a lever and a clip, so you slide the lever over and pull it up. And then there's a three pin with two populated pins up here. When that is done, you can kind of just snake it out like this, and we can throw that into a dumpster. Looking down into the hole now, we can see the punch that we've been looking at from under the car. I'm gonna get something in there that's pretty big and just smack that out, and then we're gonna be able to see the ground through there, and that's, of course, where our shifter will, uh, will come up through. So we're ready to figure out how to pin the new module here that has the MDM mode button. I, I suspect that we're gonna be robbing a pin out of whatever one of these connectors plugged into that specific button on the old SMG surround. Um, I'll have to look into that, I'll get back to you on that. And then we can put the EDC panel into our old center console, unless of course you are retrofitting CIC navigation at the same time, in which point this is your computer. I think the display changed, I don't know how to do that yet, but I think there's some exposed screws up there, you can figure that out. And then you'd have to remove the rest of this whole center console uh, to change out the actual iDrive knob to the CIC knob with the buttons around it, but that that's a video for five years from now. So here's the center console out of the car. Um, as I mentioned before, this thing comes off really easily. You just get some fingers over here. It's easier now from the bottom, of course. Just give it a press and the whole thing pops out. So on the bottom of this, we've got four connectors. We have the shift speed button, uh, power EDC and DSC, and then the big connector for the actual shift knob itself. Uh, we definitely don't need these two anymore. These we might, I mean, we won't need the switches, but we might need to, to play with those harnesses in the car to rob power and whatnot. Center console looks like this. There's those two pins at the bottom I was talking about that go into the, uh, the leather part of the center console. At this point, I'm gonna take an opportunity to clean all this up. Now that it's out of the car, we can get unprecedented access to, uh, to make this thing shine again. We're gonna get rid of this door assembly. We're not gonna be using this, the EDC uh, button panel tray thing replaces that. So if we take a look at the bottom of the shifter, this thing is just held in with four Torx 20s. I'm going to remove those and get that assembly out of here. And here's the center console cleaned up a little bit with the EDC panel in place. It just installs from the back using the four screws we took out with the ashtray and uh, fits in there like that, ready to be plugged into uh, the EDC switch. The same, we're going to use the same electrical connector that we used before. It's actually the exact same switch. And then of course we'll plug in the little um, ashtray lighter element power port as well. We're going to move on to pedals and some hydraulics now and uh, that's going to involve removing the seat, the driver's side seat from the car. And this is a pretty straightforward process. It's actually a little bit easier than the E39. Excuse the mess in here. It's it's messy. Swapping a car to a manual is a messy job. So step one is uh, move the seat all the way up, the front portion all the way up and the back portion all the way up and then move it all the way forwards. And then you'll see uh, right over here by where the seat belt comes down and screws into the seat um, on this black plastic Piece, there's kind of a round part of the cap and you'll just gonna pry it off. There's no fasteners and there's no screws, just clips. You'll pry it away from the seat there and then there's clips here on the button panel, three on top and I think three more on the bottom and you'll just carefully pry it off and set it aside. That reveals a Torx 50 bolt right here that holds the seat belt to the seat. Remove the T50. Then we can roll the seat all the way up. That will expose two T45 Torx that hold the seat rails onto the chassis and you'll remove those from the back seat. Then move the seat all the way back. Then you have black plastic um, little pieces of trim right here over the front of the metal seat rails and you just pop those off carefully with the aid of a flathead screwdriver, a pick tool, and your fingers. Then in the front there is a 
black plastic cover that covers up all of the wiring and that just pulls right off. Grab in the middle on top and pull. And uh, there's gonna be two wires that we need to disconnect. The big yellow one has a tab um, or a clip that you pull out towards you and then unplug the wire. And then there's another black part of the wire right here. It's real easy to see, it's just this wire. So there's the yellow part and here's the black part. Disconnect that. Then it's got this white little push pin thing that sits in the seat. So just pry that out with a screwdriver so the wiring harness is disconnected from the seat. After the black plastic comes off, there are two more Torx 45s that hold the seat to the chassis of the car. There's one there and then this front center one is at an angle. Uh, so remove those. At this point we're ready to remove the seat. I think it's going to come out the front of the car. It is advisable to protect the entry sill here and any of this plastic stuff with, uh, with some towels or some cardboard or something just so you don't hack it up as we remove the seat from the car. With the seat out of the car, we can see the exposed um, subwoofer speaker grill. It's held in with four Phillips head screws. Um, I removed the bracket, I slid the, the front leading edge of the carpet in front of it, and then I just reinstalled the bracket to keep tools or stuff from falling down into the subwoofer hole. Um, next up, we're gonna remove the center console tunnel. Uh, we already had the trim off, so we can move forward with uh, pulling the parking brake up. The boot just clips in here. We'll just grab it and pull it out. Uh, that'll be simple. From the back seat here, I used a 90 degree pick tool to very carefully and gently get underneath this uh, this little trim that has the two outlets in it. It pulls out. We're greeted with a few electrical connectors. We will disconnect those. The only other connector in the rear that needs to be undone is one three pin connector that plugs up straight from the bottom into the, uh, the little HVAC panel there. And then there's two more bolts in the front. There's seven millimeters that hold the center console onto uh, this bracket here. There's one on the left side and another one on the right side. Underneath the center console, we were able to unplug the iDrive knob. As you uh, move the center console here over the e-brake handle, it's a little bit circuitous. Have a, have a friend help you. Then you get down to the bottom here and there's this weird bracket that we can't figure out how to unplug, but it does have a T20 there at the bottom, of course, out of focus. Uh, so we're just going to remove that whole thing from the tunnel. So the pedal box on the E60 M5, thankfully, is already a manual brake pedal. BMW's manual brake pedals look like that. They're about two inches, two inches wide. The automatic brake pedals are like three or four inches wide. It's a different pedal, it's a different pedal box. Uh, so thankfully here we already had the manual brake pedal. So adding the clutch is, yes, as easy as adding the clutch. Now unfortunately, the the kind of area that this is in in the car um, even with the driver's seat out is just a miserable area to work in. This is what the brake pedal assembly looks like. This is off of an E60 M5 somehow miraculously located here in San Diego that we picked up on eBay and it came with the brake pedal and the clutch pedal. So what we did, instead of just swapping this entire assembly, which would be a real pain, you'd have to disconnect it from the master cylinder, um, the, the steering column is kind of in the way. So all we did was just remove the clutch pedal. It's a series of black, uh, some rubber or some plastic, some metal, um, pins and clips that hold the pedal in place and remove the spring and I recommend that you take a lot of photographs of this before you start because it is fairly sensitive. You also have that cylinder here where the clutch position sensor goes. So you're just going to take this all apart and take the individual pieces over to your E60 and install them in there in the car. Uh, this is still something that was totally miserable. It took me about seven hours to get it all done on my back and here's why it took that long. Order of operations is key. The two pins that hold in the cylinder where the clutch hydraulic line goes, um, that should be done last. Put the pedal in first. Just be careful with your order of operations there. I'm gonna do this clip on an iPhone just because the light and uh, small form factor will be a lot easier to see. So the hydraulic line that plugs into the bottom of this clutch cylinder here on the pedal box, it plugs in like that. The clip goes in from the right side, not straight on. The clip slides from the right to the left to hold it in there. It comes down here like this. It goes over behind the, the clutch, the brake pedal, and where the throttle will be. And then it goes up through the firewall in a hole right there behind all of the carpeting. You do not need to remove the carpeting. We can simply peel it out of the way like this. Then the hose that attaches the clutch cylinder here to the brake cylinder, there's already a hole in the firewall. You take a cap out and, uh, and, and just put the hose through. The hose comes way too long. You only need about a third of the, 
of the length that you uh, that you bought, which is nice. Rather have too much than not enough. As you can see, the hose actually comes through right there, and there's a small grommet to facilitate going through that hole. It's a pain in the rear to get the grommet to match up, right? Ours isn't perfect, but it works. And then on the brake fluid reservoir itself, there's a small. Uh, they already left the little nipple on there, so what you've got to do is use a razor blade. Uh, don't use side cutters or wire cutters. That's going to deform the nipple on the reservoir, but use a razor blade to, uh, to cut that nipple off and make that an open tube and then just push the hose on there. There's already a barb, it'll stay, you don't need a hose clamp. Of course, before you do that, lower the fluid level in the reservoir below that point. Uh, just don't hit the brake or clutch or anything until you've uh, replaced the fluid with fresh dot three or dot four, whatever it calls for. Talking about the hydraulic line, there's a little cutout, a little punch right here uh, that uh, that you can pry out from this side, peel the carpeting up inside, pry that out, feed the hose through. There's a grommet on the hose right where it goes through the hole. That comes down here and then you have your soft line. The soft line will come over here and I think it has to U and then this will go into the slave cylinder on the transmission itself. Obviously we want to have this done before the transmission can be reinstalled on the car. Okay, so the hole that goes through the chassis there, there's actually two grommets. There's the one grommet that comes on the pipe itself which is over here. And then there's this outer grommet that turns out we had and didn't even know we had. No, it's not supposed to have a cut in it. And that grommet surrounds this grommet. I think with this outer flange in the transmission tunnel area and these two little handles on the back of it that you could pull inside to create a better seal there. Unfortunately, by the time we discovered this, the transmission's already on. So I attempted to cut it and install it in some capacity and that didn't work. So next time that transmission's off, uh, we'll replace that or uh, get a grommet and install it. But when you do this, make sure you follow the instructions. Parts will all be listed in a spreadsheet linked in the description to this video eventually. After you're plumbed and the transmission's installed and you're connected to the master cylinder down below, you can go ahead and bleed that clutch. There's a million videos, there's a million different DIYs online. Um, go find one if you don't know how to do it and bleed the clutch. It takes about 30 minutes and your left foot will be very tired. And then as you can see, we have also put on, these are the, this is the, uh, the BMW manual kit um, aluminum pedals, which I just think look really nice, and I have the good or bad habit, depending on how you see it, of driving barefoot a lot of the time, and I love the way these things feel. Uh, it's a really nice look and a great feel as well. I did a video installing these in my E39 M5 years ago. It's pretty much the same job here, although the throttle pedal on the E60 M5 comes out really easily. It just has that five millimeter, I believe, um, hex nut there. There's a little cap in there. You pop that out, then take the nut off, and then just lift the whole pedal up and then unplug it. And do yourself that favor. Install it outside the car. It's way, way, way easier. Uh, the clutch pedal and the brake pedal suck. The included template sucks. It doesn't really line up. The clutch pedal is plastic, so that's easy to drill in. Uh, the brake pedal is, is metal. That takes some time. You need some good drill bits. Um, go a size up, then you think you're going to need a little bit of wiggle room to make these things line up right and be straight. And the problem, I'll show you on a set of pedals that are outside of a car right now, is the back of the clutch pedal is contoured. Here's a clutch pedal. It has the thing on it, which I can pry off a little bit, but it's contoured. And the studs that go through it to hold the pedal on are not really long enough. So as you drill a hole in the clutch pedal here, and then try to thread the nut on, the nut hits this contour and goes sideways. So before you install the clutch pedal, if you're going to want to install these performance pedals, do it outside, do it on the bench. Save yourself hours of heartache uh, by just filing this down or drilling larger holes in it or whatever you decide to do to make the performance pedals fit better. Let's talk about the throttle pedal for a minute. So if we look on real OEM, we can actually see that the manual and the SMG have different part numbers for the throttle pedal. That's annoying. So option S205A is the SMG, option S2MAA is the manual. Part numbers are different. They've been superseded a couple times. Uh, the new part number for the throttle is about 150 bucks, 160 bucks. But um, here's the thing. So with the SMG pedal, which is here, but as you push it all the way down to the ground, or all the way to the floor here, there's that extra little switch. It's called the kick-down switch. And that's telling the car, I need every ounce of power this engine can make, downshift the transmission, balls to the wall, let's go. And uh, the manual, that would have no function with the manual, because if you need to downshift, it can't do that for you. You can only do it yourself. So um, 
instead of replacing the whole pedal, why don't we just take out the switch that is the kickdown switch. So there's a total of six screws on the side of the throttle, and these things are super annoying. They are security pentalobe screws. They're not hex, they're not stars, they're not torques. They are pentalobes. Notice there's five sides in there and then a stud in the middle. They're like the screws that hold together bathroom stalls. So I had to go on Amazon and pick up a set of pentalobe bits for all of, I don't know, seven or eight bucks. And it's the TS-10, it's the smallest one in the kit that, that works in these. And those are just normal bits, so they fit into a screwdriver like this. You remove all six of them and lift the cover off, and then we can see how the throttle works here. We've got some cables, we've got a potentiometer, and then down at the bottom, Right there on the right side of the screen is the kickdown switch, and it simply pulls straight out of the pedal assembly. It's just held in there with friction along the plastic, and it's this little switch with some dielectric grease on it. It's very hard to actuate by hand. It's not plugged into anything. How it transmits to the computer or throughout a pin, I do not know. But with that out of there now, we have now made a manual style pedal with no more kickdown. So we can put the cover back on and put those pentalobes back in. Excuse the mess, we uh, haven't gotten any detailing yet, but down here in the pedal box area, there's a couple parts I haven't talked about yet, so we're gonna do that now, um, in terms of removal, reinstallation, and required modification. So number one is what I call the pedal box ceiling. It's the dark, black, shiny piece of plastic here that is the ceiling of the pedal box, and it's held in place with uh, four or five black Phillips head screws. We've got one here, one here, another one over there, one in that corner, maybe there's one back there, and then there's a clip uh, somewhere over here. Um, up here, just grab it there and there and pull straight down. It's got more of those tabs, um, similar to what this piece had. Uh, so we take that down, we unplug two things. There's a light, there's a speaker, black and a purple connector, unplug those. Uh, then look at the cutout for the brake pedal. The cutout for the brake pedal is already there, it's nice and neat, uh, we don't need to touch that. But obviously we need to add a cutout for the clutch pedal because right there was straight plastic. So uh, you could replace this panel with a, uh, with a BMW one, I don't know what it costs, but uh, the cutout is already there. You can already see what needs to be cut out, and in fact the little foam, the sound deadening, the heat insulation, whatever it is, um, is already cut out for the manual clutch pedal. So all you've got to do is grab a Dremel, put a plastic bit on it, put some goggles on, take five minutes, and carefully cut that off. Let it cool, smooth it out with a sanding wheel if you want, and, uh, and you've made a manual pedal box ceiling. You also need to spend some time removing uh, like this door entry guard here. This is held in with four clips. The E39 uses three, this uses four. So we just grab under there and pull straight up. Uh, then we have the panel over there by the trunk release button and the hood latch. The hood latch is held on with one Phillips head screw. Then we just pry this piece off, careful for the wiring on the trunk release button, pry that out of the way. And then there's more Phillips screws, black Phillips screws holding on the OBD2 electrical connector. And then the bracket that goes over the carpeting. The carpeting's in between the chassis and the bracket. Uh, you'll see what I mean when you get there. All right, guys, talking about the back of the engine. Obviously, we're a couple steps ahead right now. I've got the flywheel on, we've got the clutch disc in there, and we have the pressure plate on. I did replace the rear main seal. Taking the old one out is fairly simple. We just carefully drill a hole anywhere in it. Don't go in too far. You have about three quarters of an inch before you will hit the engine block. Drill a hole, thread a screw in it, put some vice grips on it, and then use um, a pry tool against the vice grips, and then use the back of the engine block for leverage and just pry it out. It takes a couple minutes. There is a BMW specific tool, it costs over hundred dollars and it's several um, weeks away that you could use to install the rear main seal. If you have one or have access to one, that's fantastic. If you don't, uh, do it the old school way. I put it in dry, I lined it up as well as I could. Make sure the seal around the uh, rear main seal doesn't get pinched as you put it in and then very gently and lightly use a hammer to carefully go around in circles about 10 times and, and then just put it in until it's flush. Of course, using a little bit of the sealing compounds at three o'clock and nine o'clock where the two pieces of the block come together right here. You'll be able to see on the old seal uh, very easily where that was. Here's a quick clip of that rear main seal. We can see at nine o'clock and three o'clock just a dab of the sealant. Uh, there's more in there that we can't see. And then I tried to get a, a little bit of little bit of an angle here um, looking to see that the seal itself is pretty much flush with the block the crankshaft just protrudes out the back uh, just a hair 
The flywheel only goes on in one way. At about 11 o'clock, it has a little sleeve or a collar, uh, so it only goes on one way, and then the torque spec for those T60 bolts will be in the spreadsheet that will eventually be linked um, again below this video once I'm done with the job. Uh, then we use the included clutch disc alignment tool. It's not perfect, it's hanging a little bit low. Uh, as we put the transmission in, that should kick it up. And then you have your pressure plate, which uses these six or seven millimeter Allen bolts. Um, it is 15 newton meters and 25 degrees for that. I just did that. So they are torque to yield and they are Loctited bolts. So we've got all this together. We're now ready to put the transmission on. Here's a brief note on a few tools here that you'll need for SMG flywheel removal as well as manual flywheel installation. Number one will be a Torx 60 socket and not any one will work. This one has been modified on a grinding wheel to, uh, to fit in there. You can't take one that's straight here. If this were how it shipped and it were a smooth a straight piece of metal that had not been bastardized on a wheel, then uh, it wouldn't fit. Or you can buy this tool, which uh, is a little bit cleaner tool, but they both do the same job, so you'll need those. Um, and secondly, this is a flywheel locking tool. You will use this when installing the manual flywheel to lock it in place to the engine block so you can torque uh, the T60 bolts on the flywheel without rotating the entire engine. I just used one of the old bell housing bolts to put through this hole, actually here on the back of the block. The teeth on this tool mesh with the teeth along the outer side of the flywheel. You can use these different extensions or sleeves if you wish, or those bolts if you want. Lock it in place and torque your flywheel. All right guys, we are ready to install this manual transmission. I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and uh, tell you all the service and maintenance items that we've done here and um, what I've replaced and then how we're kind of preparing it for installation into the car. So um, on the back here is the Jubo, the flex disc, the Guibo, however you would like to call that. And uh, it installs this way. There's these little arrows. So these are the bolts that hold the Jubo to the, to the transmission itself. The bolts go in like this. This hardware needs to be replaced. These are castle nuts. They torque to yield bolts. Just replace them all. Parts will be listed in the spreadsheet that will uh, eventually be in the description to this video when I'm done with the job. Um, that's every other bolt. The other bolts here, I just have hand tight. This is where the drive shaft will connect. We're going to do that later. Up here, this is the E60 M5 shifter carrier. It goes into the top of the transmission like this. We put new bushings here, a new one here, and a new one here. And then these pins, they slide out like this and then pull out. And we've replaced those as well. On the transmission selector rod shaft, which is the shaft here that as you shift gears moves in and out of the transmission, there's a rubber seal in there. It's not required that you replace it, but with the transmission out of the car, it's a really good time to do that. That part number is down below as well. I used a hook tool to dig into the old seal to pull it out, and then I lined up the new one with a socket. I think I used a 12 or 13 millimeter 12 point socket and just tapped it home. Um, it's home when it hits the race in there and it stops um, sounding hollow as you tap it, it just stops moving. Then you have this joint right here. This is a new piece. It's oriented this way. Um, it kind of sits and, and faces up, if you can tell right there. There's a new pin that goes through. There's a circlip. Then we have the E60 M5 selector rod. It goes on the left. The bend here is to clear the flex disc. That goes through, there's no need for any washers, and then we put a circlip at the end. We're using the E60 545i short shifter. I assume that it's applicable here in the E60 M5 as well. We've got it in that M5, we've got it in my M5, it's a great shifter. The E90 M3 and E60 M5 manual transmissions have this bracket on the back like this. That makes the manual transmission as long as the SMG transmission. We have replaced the transmission mounts here. We have new hardware on top. They have the larger flange nut on top. The bottom nuts have a smaller washer as such. Um, all the torque specs, I'm putting together a spreadsheet of torque specs. I will list that um, down below as well for this job. Then we have a new joint that goes on the end. It is installed in this position. The shift boot here, you leave the ring on it so you can pull it through the hole and this flange seals around the hole in the chassis. And it has an arrow that points towards the front of the transmission with this little flap thing in the rear. On the side of the transmission, we installed the new slave cylinder. We lightly installed this hydraulic line that will torque down and put through this bracket eventually. The bracket goes on the bottom nut like that, and these are just 13 millimeter nuts. I think I talked about the wiring harness before. Now inside the bell housing, we replaced this fork part. We replaced throwout bearing. You wanna put a little bit of lubrication on the top and bottom of the throwout bearing where it meets the fork. The slave cylinder obviously is over here. 
Uh, we replaced the spring and then the pivot point below the spring on a stock transmission from BMW, it's plastic, it's crap. Uh, we used a brass one, so that should last a heck of a lot longer. Then you're gonna use a little bit of the included assembly lubricant that comes with the clutch kit to lubricate the spline, the front face of the throwout bearing, and uh, the, the tip of the input shaft here. On the passenger side of the transmission, we replaced the transmission fluid uh, filter, which is down here. I'll have a torque spec for that. Plugged in all the wires, and then I did forget over here. On the driver's side, we replaced the fill nut. We didn't torque that one down yet since we still have to fill it. And then the drain nut for the fluid is on the bottom of the transmission. And we replaced that as well. So I'm realizing I didn't get a great clip on transmission uh, installation. And when I say great clip, I mean any clip. So uh, the transmission actually installs, it's really straightforward. You want to have two or three people uh, to help maneuver it into place. It is noticeably lighter than the SMG, uh, though it is still uh, probably about 120 pound transmission. So we actually uh, slightly damaged two of the Torx bolts that hold the transmission bell housing to the engine block. We just took those bolts, put them in a vise, cut the heads off of them, then drilled a flat, like a flat screw into the end of them and use those as nice alignment dowels or alignment pins. Thread those into the engine block a little bit and it's a great way to get the transmission lined up. We left the shifter on there and the shifter carrier and everything as I showed you a few clips ago, you just push it up through the hole. Um, it probably took about 15 minutes to get the transmission installed. Then torque the uh, 12 or 14 different Torx bolts to the bell housing, remembering that the longer two are up top inner and I think lower. Those longest two are the, the inner two upper bolts. And remember not to mess with that uh, the, the 12 o'clock bolt, which is for the starter motor. And while I'm down here, I'm gonna get a couple clips of how this looks when it's put back together. Obviously we have this tray back in place. Uh, we have the bracket that covers the mating of the transmission and the engine block back in place. And then all the different wiring and mounts and brackets for the oxygen sensors. And, uh, and on all that just kind of looks like this. It, it could go several different ways and be okay several different ways. This seems to be the way that it was before. Uh, the brackets on the side of the transmission for the oxygen sensor and EGT um, are different. The one that has an additional little clip goes over here and it's pretty easy. You'll see which wire fits in there. Um, obviously right now we're about at the end of this job. We've got the heat shields back in, but it's all pretty straightforward. Just be sure to label your parts, take your time and work with a friend. Then a note on the hydraulics here, the soft line attaches to the hard line that goes through the tunnel. It does a 180 degree bend. Then it goes into that bracket that's in between the uh, transmission and the slave cylinder. There's a grommet that goes in the bracket. It's not the tightest connection in the world, but that is how it's supposed to be. And uh, it just connects through the bracket like that. It's pretty self-explanatory. All right, guys, please bear with me. This is gonna be really hard to film, but we're under the car right now looking straight up at the transmission and we're gonna talk about these cooler lines. So since we used a E92 M3 transmission, it has a input and an output cooler line and a pump right there that would pump the fluid from the transmission through some lines up to a radiator somewhere up by the, by the engine radiator. Um, that is not needed on the M5. The E60 M5 manual transmission did not come with a cooler. It did not need a cooler, so we are not using these cooler lines. Uh, what we elected to do was buy a set of used cooler lines for an E92 M3. Here's what the E92 M3 set of lines look like. We just came over here. This is the transmission side, and uh, we used a hacksaw and just made some rough cuts, cut them off. We then found a local air conditioning shop to just weld those lines shut at the end to make sure they don't leak, plug them up. You could alternatively turn them into a U, uh, but the, the holes are above the fluid level in the transmission. The fluid's not under pressure. The pump is not wired. The pump is not active. So as long as they are closed off and tight, there should not be a problem. Alternatively, if you drive your car extremely hard and you think you're going to overheat the transmission, then you could retrofit uh, not only to pump to work, but cooler lines and a radiator somewhere up there. You would really have to drive this car hard to need that though. Underbody assembly, we're gonna talk about the drive shaft now. So during installation with the longer drive shaft, this one is completely custom. We could not find the genuine BMW anywhere. New, used, doesn't matter. I think maybe it is available new for an outrageous sum. This one uh, was just over 500 bucks, totally custom made with a serviceable U-joint, fresh center support bearing, and new CV, uh, genuine BMW CV at the end of it. So uh, I started up at the transmission, came with a new centering sleeve. You center that in the transmission output shaft, push that in. 
Still let the U-joint hang, seat the rear. The rear has a little cup on it that holds the grease, make sure that's tapped in. Um, we wanna replace all the hardware here. You probably don't need to worry about the two 13 millimeter bolts that hold the center support bearing up, but all of those up there at the flex disc on the transmission should be replaced. The six back here, the E-Torx 12 millimeter should be replaced. Um, all the torque specs are going to be eventually in the description of this video. I'll, I'll link a PDF or a, uh, a .xlsx spreadsheet that has all the values in it. Um, so I'm not going to mention them in video, but they'll be there eventually. Uh, we torqued up there first. Use a, uh, a wrench on the back side. Um, we have one that kind of has a kink in it that we can kind of hold the nut on the back and tighten that down. And we did over here. We did thread the 13s in just by hand so we didn't have to let the drive shaft hang. You don't want to let it hang on the U-joint. But everything's in and torque to spec. This one's a little bit thinner than the BMW one, but it's got a serviceable U-joint, which is cool. And uh, seems to fit very well. So everything's torque to spec now. We're gonna move on with heat shield installation. I think we're gonna start with this big piece that covers up the entire drive shaft. We have a whole bag of hardware here for it somewhere. Then we move on to the side pieces. And lastly, the little ones that go in between the cats and the transmission. All right, we're gonna try to start it. Don't know exactly what's gonna happen. If it does start, it's gonna be really loud and I'm not gonna let it run long. We're gonna move on to the transmission shield underneath the car. Uh, unfortunately, this part did change for the manual, and here's why. The SMG at the bottom of the gearbox had a, um, a long cooler, like a little radiator, and it used this fin to collect air and uh, deliver that air via this channel right here. The, the cooler would have gone right there. Well, that doesn't have an application anymore on the manual transmission. So this panel costs $581, and I don't think you should spend any of that money replacing it if yours is in good enough shape already. This one isn't perfect. It's got a couple washed out holes, and this heat shielding was coming off, so we just got some hardware, actually old E39 hardware, and, and reattached it. All you've got to do is break the rivets off that held this whole thing on with, uh, with some needle nose pliers, a screwdriver, some wire cutters, whatever. Take this whole thing off, get a Dremel, put a plastic bit on it, cut this piece off. You don't need this anymore. Unless you're going to put an SMG back in, uh, this is worthless. This goes to the SMG cooler. So, so we're going to bin it. That's better. And then you can go ahead and reinstall the piece that's left over, it's not the cleanest cut in the world, but hey, that's exactly what the manual one looks like, and it saves us $581. A few more parts. On the right, we have the e-torx bolt that holds the transmission oil cooler lines onto the side of the transmission itself. Uh, we've actually been driving the car a little bit without this bolt. Uh, we used a bolt of the same length and thread pitch, which has been working fine, but of course we want the right part in there. So this guy had to come from Germany. It'll be listed in the parts spreadsheet below this video. And then finally, the most fun thing to put on in the world, because it means you're about done, is the shift knob and boot itself. It's a one-piece uh, one piece bit like this. And um, take note that March 2007, the cutout shape for the boot changed. This is the early one. Uh, factory manual cars were only September 1st, 2006 through well, the end of production, but this is, uh, so this boot would only be applicable from September 1st, 06 to March 1st of 07. If you're March 1st, 07 or later, you're gonna want the other one that's a bit more rectangular, looks a bit more modern, less traditional BMW. So uh, we're actually gonna pop this in the car right now, which I have been uh, very much looking forward to. Now we will cover the wiring portion of this. This is the, the factory shift knob, so it is illuminated. So you'll need to source a switched 12 volt and ground line and the proper connector. Uh, we'll cover that in part three, which will be about wiring. Otherwise, you just line this, plug it in, line it up on there and smack it down with the, uh, with the heel of your palm. I need more hands. So I'll show you the finished product here in 20 seconds. We need a quick clip on the steering wheel. Of course, the steering wheel part number changed for the manual cars as steering wheel mounted shift paddles are no longer necessary. Now, it's not, of course, required that you change the steering wheel. It works fine to have the paddles and not use them. Pulling them doesn't do anything. And yes, for the first couple hundred miles you drive this car, you'll occasionally be inadvertently pulling a paddle and thinking, why didn't it shift? Well, 
because we did that. Now, of course, you have a couple options here. Option A, just leave it in there and look at the paddles that you don't use. I don't like that. Option B would be to remove the steering wheel and remove the paddles. I will link the video in the description below that I made several months ago on replacing the paddles. Of course, we replaced that upshift paddle only a couple of months before taking the SMG out of this car. And of course, yes, we also replaced the clutch like 7,000 miles ago, and that was wasteful too. The problem with removing the paddles is it will leave some holes in the back that, uh, that you will certainly feel. The best option would be to replace Place the wheel either with a new $876 or used $500 on eBay E60 M5 manual steering wheel. They're very hard to come by seeing that these cars are extremely rare and they're extremely expensive even in their used form. So I'll just leave that up to you guys. The steering wheel itself comes off fairly easily, um, comes apart pretty well. Um, just look at the video down below to see how I took it off to replace that paddle. It is June 5th, 2020. We just put the DME box back together, the cowling. Uh, everything else in the engine bay, the transmission belly pan, we are about done. This was the mechanical video that showed, um, not in great detail, again, I'm assuming that if you're willing to attempt manual swapping one of these cars, you know how to install a clutch disc and remove a transmission and take an exhaust system off a car. It's all bolts, none of it's rocket science. But we just put the pan back in place, the trans pan, we can see there where we modified it uh, to just suck in air and not deliver it anywhere specific. I'm, Pretty proud of that one. Uh, this has all gone really pretty well. It's clean and uh, and stay tuned. We'll get some clips, new car running and driving maybe a little bit, do some sort of a review. I don't know what's in the future, but um, hopefully more content. I've been happy with the uh, demand for the E60 content and appreciation and such. All right, guys, that completes part number two of the E60 M5 manual swap. There is at least one more part of this video coming that will focus more so on wiring, uh, coding, pinning, stuff like that. I'm not going to walk you through it like a baby, but I will tell you where to look and uh, give you a good overview of exactly what needs to be done. So uh, part two featured the mechanicals, putting the transmission on, exactly what, what parts need to be uh, replaced and stuff like that. So uh, the meat and potatoes is, is done. In fact, the car is done. Uh, so we'll just have to get this video together here and, and look for about two weeks from now. So uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of this. This has been ridiculously fun and rewarding. And if you guys want to see um, kind of a thoughts and impressions of the SMG versus the manual, what do we like better about each one? Is it worth doing it? Um, kind of a review type thing. Let me know in the comments below and we'll see about putting something like that together. So thanks for watching part two. We'll talk in part three. Take care.